Welcome to Kafka Summit Americas 2021. I'm Tim Berglund, I'm the chair of the Kafka Summit Program Committee, and I also run the developer advocacy team at Confluent. This is our third virtual Kafka Summit this year. I know that's a lot. Uh, it may be, hopefully, our last virtual Kafka Summit ever. But while we're still virtual, we wanted to try something a little different. The sessions are still gonna be pre-recorded with speakers available live for Q&A during the session, but the keynotes are gonna be live streamed downstairs in just a few minutes. While I'm up here though, I wanted to point out over, I think like there, about two miles that way in Sunnyvale is LinkedIn headquarters. That's where Kafka was born 10 years ago. Pretty crazy to think about, it's just right over there and it was 
it was 10 years ago. You might also notice some like train looking infrastructure down there. There's a Caltrain line that goes right by Confluent headquarters where we are here. You are guaranteed to hear a train whistle at some point during the keynotes. Just kind of makes it, I don't know, a little more uh, authentic, that live experience. So anyway, uh, let's head downstairs. And I wanted to think a little bit about this, this, this 10 years of Kafka. And this is a community that's still growing a lot. And I know a lot of you who are here with us for Summit this year are joining us for the first time. You're brand new to Kafka. Some of you may have been here from the beginning. Wherever you are in that Kafka journey, whether you're brand new or you're a person who's been contributing from the start of things, you are welcome here. This is a place for you. And honestly, I'm glad you've got this browser tab open and you're joining us for Summit. So let me, oh, looks like the elevator's already here, head downstairs. I'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, well, here we are on the ground floor. We've got a whole video broadcast studio set up in there. I'm gonna show you that in just a minute. But first, I wanna show you some things going on in the lobby. Like over here, near and dear to my heart, this is the living Moss Kafka logo, a living, growing thing, just like the Kafka community. Yes, that's cheesy, but it's also true. It, we missed it, and it's, this comes from the San Francisco summit in 2019, the last time we were all together in one room, so I kind of love this thing. Over here, a little more conflicted, this guy actually greets you when you're walking in, and uh, you don't know this, but on all of the floors, you walk out of the elevator, and he's here doing this. I have no idea how it happened. It's not, not creepy, right? But there he is. Anyway, I, I just, I don't know what to say. Now, uh, popping up in the browser, I hope about now, is gonna be a poll asking you for a word asking you for the word that you think of when you think of the Kafka community, when you think of Kafka, when you think of your work with Kafka, you know, just a single word, enter that in there. And after the keynotes, uh, we're gonna have a word cloud automatically generated using computers. Uh, and we get to take a look at what kind of collectively what we all think of, uh, of the community. It's a pretty cool thing. We did this last year. I just, I love it. I wanna do it again. So here we are in a room appropriately named Streams. I don't know if you can see that. And uh, take a look around. It's, it's like I said, it is a video production studio. The screens, the buttons, I want to press every single button. The struggle is real. I've been advised not to, and I've been cooperating so far, but it is difficult. I don't know if you can hear the train whistle like I just warned you about too. It's, it's a real thing. Over here is Jay. Hey, good morning, Jay. Hey, Tim. Good, good to see you. What it's you working good on? Good to see you working on my talk, trying to come up with a title. And uh, I think I've got something really good. Okay, what are you thinking? Data mesh, you so fresh. Uh, so no you, bad you ideas. You, you don't like it. Well, no, it, no bad ideas. Maybe I, something I about did, logs? Uh, logs, it's, it's an old standby. I mean, yeah. it's, you can't go wrong. I notice you're also a messy desk guy, I myself. Oh, this I mean, it's, it's, it's the there's like no food, but this is, you know, the good creative process. This, this is how I do it too. How about this? How about data mess to data mesh? Wow, Tim, we do not pay you enough. Uh, evidently not. We'll talk about that later. All right, let's, let's get started. We're running this thing. Let's go. All right, hello again. Here we are in the actual studio. And our first keynote uh, this morning at Kafka Summit 2020, 2021 Americas actually is gonna be Jay Krebs. And uh, let me give him a proper introduction. Jay is the co a co-founder of Confluent. Uh, he's the CEO of Confluent. He's one of the co-creators of Apache Kafka. And he is gonna give a talk entitled this morning, Data Mess to Data Mesh. And uh, that title actually was his idea. So Jay, welcome to the stage.
All right. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. This is my first time doing a live talk in a couple of years, and I think it's a lot better than uh, just talking to a video recording. So um, I'm really excited. I'm going to be talking today uh, about this idea of a data mesh. And this is something that's gotten a lot of traction. This may be something that you're thinking about or reading about. Um, I'm going to talk about how this relates to the world of Kafka and event streaming and this larger project of connecting a company around data in motion. Uh, before I get into that, though, I always like to start um, with any new trend and try and talk about you know, what's the underlying thing that drives it? What's the, what's the root cause? And I think that there's a big idea that kind of pushes a lot of these things in our world, which is that, in some sense, companies are becoming software. And this is something that sounds a little funny when you say it. Um, you know, what does it mean if a company is becoming software? But what I mean by this is that companies are, in some sense, becoming software-defined. You know, the core aspects of how companies interact with their customers, how the goods and services are produced, how it all stitches together, the activity of the business is just increasingly defined end to end in software. And this is actually a, a pretty significant change. If you kind of think back to how software, you know, came into organizations, it was a bit at a time. You know, an organization was ultimately a group of people that talked to each other to, to get the job done. And you know, applications were added here and there, um, really disconnected from each other. And still, the integration was, was among the people. And the applications kind of stood alone. You might have uh, some systems helping the HR team, some systems helping the sales team, systems helping marketing, um, some custom software of your, your own creation. But ultimately, you know, a, a company was about the, the org chart, the people. And I think this is something that's you know, significantly changed, and it's easy to miss what's changed. But if you look at the architecture of a modern company, there's just a huge amount of software. There's, there are more applications by you know, hundreds or thousands of times. There's more databases and data systems and data warehouses and analytics platforms and SaaS layers, and more than anything, it all needs to connect. It all needs to work together. And the result done poorly is, is really a big mess. You know, it is this giant spaghetti picture that we've always talked a lot about. And um, I, I think that that is, more than anything, you know, a big change in the world that we're all trying to cope with. And, you know, I, I think it's worth asking the question, you know, what, what's driving this? Why all this integration? Why does everything have to connect now? You know, what causes it? And I think the answer is really simple. You know, this is something that customers demand. You know, customers expect to have rich experiences um, where the bar is really set by the best of breed tech companies. And they expect this now from every company that they interact with. And for a lot of companies, maybe the, the digital side of the business was a, a bit of a sidecar that didn't get as much attention. You know, I think during the pandemic, it's highlighted just how important that is to a first class customer interaction. And it's not really just the front end, it's also you know, all the internal operations of a company, how goods and services are produced, manufactured, distributed around the world, delivered to customers, all that logistics and operations is increasingly driven end to end in software. And you know, companies are really competing on this dimension. And this is a big change in how we think about software architecture. You know, if, we, if we think back, um, you know, some decades ago, software architecture was really about what was inside an application. You know, how many tiers should it have? And how should we organize the code? You know, how should we structure things internally? But if we think about what software architecture is increasingly about, obviously the internals of an organization matter, but increasingly it's about how do you build a company in software? How do all these applications come together? How do they communicate? How do they key off of each other? How can we do that in a way that's scalable, you know, both in systems terms, but also in organizational terms? And at the heart of this, this problem and this movement is really the rise of a new set of concepts around events and event data and event streams. And this is a key aspect of how companies connect how you can decouple systems, and, and a key part of you know, the emerging architecture for companies. And one of the things that's so interesting about events is they, they kind of have a, a dual um, way of being. They're both a notification of something that happened, uh, as well as data about what happened. So if we think about maybe the stream of sales, maybe in a retailer that are happening all around the world, you know, each of these sales events, it's both a notification 
that might trigger some action, some restocking, changes in order systems, et cetera. But it's also data that might flow into some system to be stored, the, the record of sales that needs to be analyzed or persisted. Um, and so, you know, it both acts as, you know, something that drives applications as well as something that flows as data. And these two um, use cases, these two uses of events are, are actually interrelated and right at the heart of what I'm going to be talking about. So there's really two movements that are arising, and I think that they have um, a certain analogy between each other. So microservices, this is something that's been around that's ultimately asking a question of, hey, how can we decouple and structure the communication between our applications? Uh, and data mesh, this is something that's really about um, how can we decouple uh, the movement of data and, and integrate around that? And both are trends towards decentralization. Both of these are asking the question of how we can structure this in the large in a way that all the parts of the company can kind of move independently. And I think it's, it's interesting to actually see some of the similarities between these two movements. You know, in many ways it kind of, re, you know, represents a little bit of this duality of events. And so I'll start with microservices. Most people are familiar with this idea. You know, the, the bane uh, of the classical software engineering world is the big bad monolith, where you have, you know, the jumping ground of all code that's continually metastasizing and adding, you know, new modules and bits. And, you know, like a lot of monolithic centralized processes, um, any kind of big application starts to get slow. As you add more people who need to, you know, actually accomplish um, new objectives, and they're all trying to do it in one big code base that has to all work together and be qualified together and shipped together, it always gets slower. You can do it better and you can do it worse, but it, it simply doesn't scale. And, you know, one of the few ways that we've come up with to cope with this is to try and split this up, try and turn it into ind independent services or applications that can communicate together. And this can actually reach a larger scale. This can connect more than what you could have in the one monolith. And events and event streams are, are really an important aspect of this. There's obviously synchronous communication between services, but a lot of what happens in a company is fundamentally asynchronous. It's not happening you know, while your customer waits, it's happening in the background. And this event-driven microservices has been a, a key aspect of actually being able to do this in the large across a company without the level of coupling. And now if we turn to the data side of events, the data world, there's actually a, a similar monolith. And to look at this, it makes sense to go back a decade or so and look at kind of the classic data integration architecture. And the idea here is we have a few independent applications. They have their own relational database. Um, they don't really need to interoperate or relate to each other. Um, data flows really in one direction, from left to right, where we might scrape data out of these relational databases, we might load it into, you know, a monolithic data warehouse perhaps at the end of the day. And there's usually a single team that would be responsible for that load and they would gather all the requirements uh, for the use of data around the company and they would structure the data in a way that's usable. And to some extent, you know, this works, right? Like, you know, this, this is a monolith, but in a simple enough world, it, it's actually quite functional. You can get the needs that you have at least to serve the kind of reports and analytics that were the concern of this architecture. But if we look at the world today, it's actually quite different, right? I, I showed this picture. There, there isn't just one destination for data. It isn't the case that individual applications stand alone. Um, increasingly, there's vastly more data, vastly more systems and teams, and all of it has to integrate. And if you try and approach this with the same organizational approach, the same technological approach, where there's kind of a monolithic data team that gathers all the requirements, you know, for everything in the organization and tries to prioritize um, who gets help with their data needs each quarter, um, it's going to be a huge bottleneck. And, and it is. And this is something a lot of companies suffer with. Um, and, you know, it, it's just a bad experience. In some part of a company, you have a team that is resourced to go do something important but they need data, or they need to integrate with something else. And that creates this dependency on another team, and you have to, you know, uh, argue about the prioritization, and it gets bumped out, you know, till next quarter, and you can't really make progress, and it's frustrating, and it's slow. And so, you know, this kind of centralized, monolithic approach to data, it, we're really just, you know, past the point where that's workable. We have to come up with something which scales better. 
And actually, like in the microservices world, I think event streams have a really important role to play here in the flow of data across a company. You know, this is not just about triggering applications. This is also about the flow of changes that can come to different data systems and how that flows out to other use cases for data into analytics systems, search systems, caches, uh, all the different consumers of data that may store it and ingest it and index it for their use cases. And these two kind of roles of data kind of corresponds to the two, you know, kind of dual nature uh, of events that I pointed out, that it's, you know, the events are both being used as data, which flows into storage systems, and it's being used as a kind of trigger, which um, you know, actually activates some activity from an application. And very often, the same event stream is being used for both. The sales are both triggering you know, restocking, and they're also being loaded into your data warehouse, for example. And you know, this is a really important component of how you can start to decouple the flow of data, how can you, you can start to decentralize the flow of data. You want to have something where you know, it's much more of a publish subscribe mechanism. Different parts of the company can publish out what's happening in their area. Consumers can tap into that and read it. You know, this is obviously a key foundational element of how you're gonna be able to scale across a company. We've talked about the idea of really having a kind of central nervous system that allows the different parts of the company to connect and come together. Um, and so obviously event streams are a key part of this, but it really raises the question of how do you actually do this, right? How do you actually make this work in the large? And um, you know, this is something we spend a lot of time with our customers. I'm always uh, reminded a little bit of this internet meme, um, which is how to draw an owl. And there's, there's just two simple steps. First, you draw some circles, and then step two is you draw the rest of the effing owl, right? And the, the joke, of course, is that that second bit um, hides a, a few key steps that you have to get right to, to have a proper owl here. And it's, it's actually similar, I think, in the microservices world where really getting the principles, practices, and tooling right to do this in the large is critical to success. I think it's equally true in the world of data flow where you have to really get both the principles and the practices right to be able to, to scale. And this is something that we see when we interact with our customers at Confluent. Um, we find that you know, as companies implement uh, event streaming and Kafka, there's kind of a couple different stages. There's kind of early, you know, decentralized interest. Um, at some point, maybe there's production systems in different parts of the company, probably disconnected, that are using event streams. And at some point, it really does become part of the architecture. It becomes a connective layer across teams. And to really get to that state where you're getting leverage out of data, where it's connecting across the organization, it's actually not just a matter of technology. You really have to have you know, both technology and you know, people and practices working together in the same way. And I, I think these kind of you know, good systems are ultimately a function of both. And so in this talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about both you know, the people and principles aspect of this. You know, how should you think about and organize uh, around data um, as well as you know, some of the software tools, including some exciting stuff that we've built at Confluent to try and help support this. And you know, to do this, I'm, I'm gonna use uh, the kind of key principles of the, the idea of a data mesh. And data mesh, this is a, a, a concept that was popularized by Jamak Dagani, and we had a you know, whole set of thought leadership around it. And I think it, it really provides some key principles that you can start to organize your thinking around as you try and scale the use of data. And I think this is really key. Whenever you need to get a large group of people to think and act the same way, it's, it's really helpful if you can boil it down. And so there's four key principles, um, domain ownership, data as a product, self-service data, and federated governance. And I'm gonna divide these up a little bit um, and kind of talk about you know, the first two as being about how data is produced. How can we scale the production of data and how can we do that in a way that's effective? And then the second two are kind of about how data is consumed, what makes it possible to easily consume data in this new decentralized world. And so I'll start with the first, how data is produced. And the idea here is really simple and, and in a way kind of obvious. If we want to scale, we have to decentralize ownership. We can't have a monolithic team that's required to know everything about all of the data everywhere in the organization and every change that's happening as every little bit of software evolves and moves. It's just not scalable. 
it has to be the case that people who are domain experts in an area who own the production systems there, who are responsible for the creation of that data, that they're responsible for how that data gets out to the rest of the organization. And it has to be that that, that mechanism that by which they give data out to the rest of the, the organization, that that's actually treated as a kind of product or API which gets the same level of product thinking and product management to actually make it good and make sure it meets the needs that other teams have and make sure that it's simple and easy to use. And if this is done well, then suddenly each area, you know, you don't need to worry so much about the details of what happens in it. You just need to worry about what they provide out, uh, you know, their data deliverables, their data products, their kind of data API. And um, if we can get this right, we can actually start to, you know, decentralize the production of data. The key question that this raises is, what is that interface? What's an API for data? Um, how can we deliver this? And, and this is what ultimately companies have to agree on. The same as if you're going to have microservices, you have to agree about how, to, how do services communicate? How can I call your service? How can you call my service? In this world, it's about how can I deliver data to you in a way that you can depend on, that can evolve, that can change, that meets the requirements that you have in your part of the organization. And you know, kind of the simplest thing that might work is, well, you know, why not just dump out some CSV files at the end of the day, and you know, we can put them all in S3 or some data lake, and people can pick up what they need when they need it. And you know, to some extent, this can work, but, but it actually has a, a pretty key problem, which is if we want to support the operational uses for data, the production systems that run the business, that face customers, we can't be dumping out data at the end of the day. It just doesn't make any sense. We're going to have something that's out of date, and it's going to look wrong to customers. It's going to cause all kinds of bugs and confusion. We can't really have out-of-date data flowing around the organization. You need something real-time. And that's really what's driven the rise, I think, of Kafka in this role. This idea of you know, creating, using event streams as a feed to connect things. And this, this has a set of key advantages, right? First, as I said, it's real-time, right? This can support both operational use cases as well as deliver it to offline systems, to data lakes and data warehouses and analytics platforms that may, may or may not need to be real-time. Um, you know, secondly, it's scalable. You can actually go from the very large volume operational data, the stuff that is being generated by machines, and you can take all of that, but you can also take the very high value transactional data and have strong guarantees across all of this. And this is really critical to support the variety of different data types that, that companies have to deal with. And then obviously it's multi-subscriber. Consumers can come and go. Um, you don't need to pay attention to every single consumer. There's not a, you know, a high interlock between the producer and the consumer. This makes it actually truly decoupled. And finally, it's a kind of universal mechanism. You know, Kafka can, you know, be public, can be take you know, streams of data that are published that can be loaded into search systems, can be loaded into caches, can be loaded into data warehouses, can trigger applications. It kind of connects to everything. It, you know, it's a universal exchange. Typically, if you're exposing a database table, it has certain query capabilities, but it may or may not be the ones that, that your um, users need. By providing a kind of change log or stream, you can cover the broad uh, set of different data types. And this works both across you know, pure events, you know, what happened, the sales that may be occurring at a point in time, the, you know, the things that in a data warehouse would be you know, in the fact tables. Um, but it also actually works just as well for mutable data. Right? You can provide you know, change data capture streams, the streams of what changed in a database. And this can be replicated um, in real time or you know, offline periodically. Um, you know, into caches, into derived data stores, into data lakes, um, you know, into data warehouses. This, this actually covers both these types of data. And so, you know, if, if we actually make this uh, our kind of API between teams, then we have a mechanism by which we can kind of give ownership of data in each domain to a particular team. We can start to treat that output as a key product, just like their UI or their APIs would be. Their, their data streams need to be thought of as being as important, you know, having structured schemas that represent the data. This is a key part of that contract to the rest of the organization. So that's a little bit about scaling and decentralizing the production of data. But if we do this, we, we actually raise a couple problems, which um, you know, are around the consumption of data. If there's no longer one team that can do it all, 
how, how are we going to actually truly make this um, self-service? How are we going to allow people to act independently um, if there's a ton of infrastructure difficulties and technical overhead to accomplishing this? We can't really push it out to every team. And if it isn't safe to do this, how, you know, we have to figure out how we govern data, how we discover it. These are the problems that start to arise. So I'll start by talking about self-service data. You know, how can we make this something that, you know, for each of these teams where producing data is just one of the things that they're responsible for, how can we make it easy enough that there's no real burden for them to produce and there's very little burden to support the different consumers? How can we decentralize the infrastructure component in such a way that self-service is really possible? And um, why would this be better if we did it? Well. You know, first of all, we've solved a couple problems here. Yeah, you know, we've gotten rid of the kind of monolithic data warehouse that has to solve all the needs. Um, we've actually allowed data modeling to scale out uh, to all these different teams. The team that is responsible for the structure of data is the same team that's responsible for the creation of data. And if they do this well, they can reason about how it's going to change. They know when it's going to change. They can think about their consumers and produce the right thing for them. And by doing this, by decentralizing, we can actually move at the pace that the business is investing in different areas. We no longer have this central team that may be misaligned with everyone else that's a bottleneck for the rest of the organization. We no longer have the long line of people waiting. So that's why we want to do it. Let's talk now about how to do it. How can we actually make data self-service? Well, I think the, the key to making you know, infrastructure for data really self-service is cloud. You know, you can always try to do this internally in a company. I ran, um, you know, chunks of a data infrastructure team um, at LinkedIn, and our job was to provide data capabilities internally. But it's really, really hard to make it truly self-service, to make it kind of no touch, everybody gets what they want. Um, ultimately, you're, you end up trying to build, you know, the completeness of a full cloud product. If you have a real cloud product, it makes it really easy. A lot of the infrastructure can go into the background. To do this, you need to have something that's truly cloud native. And th this has been a focus for us at Confluent um, with Confluent Cloud. How can we actually make something that is a true cloud native product that's actually self-service, where you don't have to be in the operational details? How can we do that in a way that teams could start to just use it independently without having to you know, get deeply into the operational aspects of it? And there's a number of things you have to do to get this right. You know, first, you have to actually just make it really easy to create clusters. You need to provide access to the broader ecosystem uh, around Kafka. So we, we also make KSQL self-service. We provide access to all the different connectors so you can hook up to different systems. Obviously, you need that full set of things. So that kind of self-service ability to opt in, create a cluster, work with that cluster, that's key. But it's not just that. You also have to handle the operational side of this. You know, if it turns out that each team in your company that wants to produce data has to build a mini Kafka operations organization, um, it's just not going to be feasible. They're not going to have that expertise. And so we've put really deep investments into tiering out storage so that we can support unbounded storage. You don't have to pre-allocate some amount of capacity. You're not going to run out if you end up producing too much data. We support elastic expansion um, and automatic rebalancing so that load is always well balanced. This takes away a lot of the more complex operational details of Kafka so that teams can just use it and not have to invest heavily in the operational components. And so this, this is another key thing we've done with Confluent Cloud to try and make this just really easy to use. Um, but I'm going to talk about one uh, more feature that's really important that we just released. And what makes this so important is it's not enough to just get the operational details right in one location. You know, companies are ultimately these big, complicated, geographically distributed beasts. You know, they have parts that are in the cloud, parts that are in different cloud regions, parts that may be in different clouds, or parts that may be on-premise. Um, it can't be the case that everybody who you know, works and produces data and wants to provide that out to the organization, it can't be the case that they have to get a PhD in cloud networking and failover architectures to be able to actually provide that to all the locations and systems and environments that need it. We have to somehow solve the problem of managing the replication of data geographically across all the different complicated parts of an organization. We have to make it easy to fail over and fail back. And um, this is something we've worked on for a long time. We've had a series of uh, different tools that help with this. 
But in, you know, now in, at Confluent, we've, we've actually created a really exciting feature called cluster linking that we think that makes this incredibly easy and declarative. And Addison, a product manager at Confluent, is gonna run us through a demo of what this is and how it works. It's something we're really excited to show. So Addison. Thanks, Jay, and hello, Kafka Summit. When we were building Confluent Cloud, we knew that we needed to abstract away a lot of the complexity that comes with using Kafka to make sure you could focus on your business. We needed to make it self-service via a UI, a CLI, and a RESTful HTTP interface. We needed to take care of all the upgrades, patches, and data balancing, make it elastic, make scaling storage a thing of the past with a new storage engine. The provisioning of connectors and the scaling of tasks needed to be point and click. We also needed to add stream processing with KSQL DB. When it came time to tackle geo-replication, we knew we couldn't take the same connect-based approach that is used today. We need to make a more intuitive way to handle cluster to cluster geo-replication that doesn't require a PhD in networking. We asked the question, can geo-replication be as easy as creating a topic? Turns out it can. Let me show you with a quick inventory management demo. I have a dedicated cluster running in GCP in US East 1. This will act as our centralized inventory cluster. I have two other clusters, one in Azure in Europe and another in AWS running on US West 2. We need to share inventory data with the centralized cluster on GCP. Now we could set up a connect cluster, manage the tasks, and manage the offsets as the data gets replicated from one cluster to another. But that is too complex and not as performant as it could be. Let's see how cluster linking makes this easier by mirroring data from one cluster to another, byte for byte, with no extra moving parts. I'm going to use the Confluent Cloud CLI cluster linking command to create two links between our two warehouse clusters and our centralized cluster in GCP. The first link we'll create is from our US warehouse cluster to the logistics cluster. Now let's run that command again, but from Europe to our centralized logistics cluster. That's it, all linked up. Now I just have to choose what topics I want to mirror from one cluster to another over these links. To mirror over the data from the two clusters, all we have to do is create a special kind of topic called a mirror topic. This topic is a byte for byte mirror of the data in our source topic. That means offsets are mirrored perfectly byte for byte as I move the data from one cluster to another. And I don't have to worry about creating a second source of truth. All the offsets are the same. Creating a mirrored topic is easy using the Confluent Cloud CLI or REST API. Create it with the Confluent Cloud Kafka mirror create command. Now that those mirrored topics are created, the data is flowing over the links. Now all we have to do is consume these mirrored topics like we would any other topic. We can see all the data flowing from our warehouse clusters on Azure and AWS to our centralized cluster on GCP. That's it, cloud native offset preserving global geo replication across environments all in about 60 seconds. Cluster linking is generally available in Confluent Cloud, so go check it out. Thanks, and back to you, Jay. So I think that these you know, self-service features are key to actually decentralizing, to allow teams to produce data without having to worry about all the operational aspects. But now that we've done that, we have a new problem, which is where is my data? Data is all over the place. We have to reason about how you find the right thing, how you ensure that it's high quality, um, ultimately, you know, how do we federate the governance of data? When there was one monolithic team that did everything, and there was one place where everything was in our data warehouse, the world was actually a little simpler, right? How can we get back that simplicity without slowing everybody down, without having kind of the monolithic, you know, tool that has to be integrated with every other system in the organization, without having the monolithic team that does all the work? You know, what's the solution to federate governance and scale this out across the, an organization? This is something that we've thought a lot about at Confluent and something where we have some pretty exciting product announcements to talk about. So, you know, th th these are the problems I need to solve. You know, wh where do I find, uh, you know, data about a customer? What's the right ID for a payment? You know, what does that ID mean? Who's responsible for this? This data looks out of date. Is it right? How can, I get, how can I actually check that? How can I tell where it comes from? How can I tell how up to date it is? How can I discover all this about what I've got? And how can I do this with this real-time streaming data that's changing all the time? 
And so we're introducing a new set of features called stream governance. And this takes the best practices for decentralized federated governance and applies it automatically with uh, Confluent. And this really has three components. The first is around stream quality. How do I avoid bad data? How can I enforce schemas? How can I check that? How can I ensure compatibility? What's the contract between team A and team B? How can you evolve that contract? This takes uh, a lot of what we've done with our schema registry and helps really enforce it across the full set of tools. You know, next is our, our stream catalog. How can I actually discover data? How can I tag what it means? How can I find the right thing and figure out who owns what? This is a critical question that you have to answer about data. And finally, stream lineage. This is incredibly cool. This is like Google Maps for all your data flow created in real time off of the actual flow of data. There's no extra work you have to do to instrument anything. It's just created as data flows and as those flows change. So it's an always up-to-date version of what got where, when it got there, how much of it there was. It's incredibly powerful. And to talk about these features, uh, David, the product manager for Stream Governance, is gonna give us a demo of some of this functionality. David? Thank you, Jay. Hi, everyone. My name is David, and I'm one of the product managers here at Confluent. Today, I'm super excited to show you what we've been up to when it comes to governing and discovering data in motion. So let's say you want to build a new streaming application, and you're trying to search across hundreds of event streams on Confluent. Or you want to make some changes on a pipeline and need to understand all the downstream dependencies from a particular topic. Or say you have this auditor on your back asking you where on Confluent you store personal identifiable information. Well, these are all great questions, but today you're left with asking around the office, setting endless meetings to chase people, or keeping some of this information documented in medieval things like spreadsheets and internet pages. As you might imagine, this is not productive or scalable, and we've seen this firsthand with some of our customers. As you grow your investments in event-driven architectures, you need a platform that can support you with data knowledge sharing, collaboration amongst teams, implementation of governance processes, and full visibility into what's happening at any time. In summer, you need something that can govern and democratize your data in motion to unlock its expansion. What I'm about to show you, and what we are releasing today in Confluent Cloud, is the beginning of this journey, a truly self-service data in motion platform that has governance embedded by design. We call it stream governance, and we build it because we believe this is very important for your success as you move towards being an event-centric enterprise. So for this demo, we're going to put ourselves in the shoes of Francisco. Francisco is an engineer on the data team of the United States Aviation Monitoring Department, also known as Flywatch. So you, Francisco, and your team, you have a very important job, taking care of the data that keeps us all safe in the skies. So this is fast and furious, real-time sensitive data that informs the position of every aircraft in the US airspace. And naturally, Kafka is this data backbone. Now, it's a Friday night and you're on call as you normally are every month. It's late and uh, you just had a crazy work week. So you're just chilling, watching a nice movie while cuddling your chihuahua named Streams. Now, as the movie gets into its climax, you get a call. And on the other side, it's your boss yelling about some aircraft data not showing up for the LaGuardia airport monitoring. So what do you do? What do you say? Maybe say it's the wrong number and hang up? Or pass the phone to Streams the Chihuahua? Well, no need for that. Lucky for you, you have Confluent Cloud. And just in time with the new stream governance capabilities that we are releasing today that can help you get back to your movie in no time. All right, so let's do this. Great, so we are now online and looking at the Flywatch Monitoring Control Center. On the screen are all the airport applications consuming from their respective topics in Confluent Cloud. As we can see, the LGA, LaGuardia, application screen is blank. So, let's quickly jump to Confluent Cloud to investigate more. First thing I'll do is use the new stream lineage tool to visualize and understand how event streams are flowing through Confluent. For the first time, I can follow the lineage of my data and stop by anywhere along the way to get more information. Each node on the graph represents a topic or an application that is producing or consuming from a topic like a connector, a SQL DB query, or your own coded application, and the edges represents the data flowing between them. Note that this graph is built automatically from the activity of producers and consumers of data, with no additional work or instrumentation needed from my side. 
Confluent is connecting the dots for me. So, starting from the left, I can see all the aircrafts publishing their own location to a topic named aircraft. These are Java applications configured with the Kafka client ID as the actual aircraft ID. Then, subscribing from this topic, I have a Kafka Streams application that is filtering out any PII data like the pilot name. In fact, this application is using the new tagging feature for schema fields to determine which values should be masked. Next, I have a series of KSQL DB queries routing these events to the respective airport topics. Finally, I can see all the FlyWatch applications I showed on the initial control center screen consuming from these topics. One thing I notice immediately is that the LaGuardia topic is not showing up on my lineage. Something must be off with this KSQL DB query. So, let me go ahead and inspect this node. Going to the query clause, I can see we are using a field called TrueTrack to filter events. This seems like a good follow-up for me. Using the new stream catalog functionalities, I can now search and discover what TrueTrack is. The catalog takes me to the scheme of this field, where I can learn more about this data definition. Schemas are incredibly powerful for governing data in motion. They don't just make explicit the data contracts between producers and consumers, but also power data discoverability since they are a primary source of data information. I found that TrueTrack is tagged as deprecated, and now I have context for why the KSQL DB query is failing. Let me also add the tag do not use to make it super clear for other users to come. Great, so now I can ping the owner of this KSQL DB query to take it from here. This is the end of the story. I used the new self-service governance tools on the platform to successfully help me out this Friday night. I'm super happy, Streams the Chihuahua is barking in happiness, my boss is happy, everyone is happy. All of this is now live in your Confluent Cloud, so please go and check it out. If you want to learn more about stream governance, please join me today at 11 a.m. Pacific time for the session Navigating Your Data in Motion. Thank you all, and back to you, Jay. Great. So I, we're really excited about this functionality. It's probably the most requested set of features from our customers uh, of all time. U ultimately, how you govern data is on everyone's mind. I, I think there's kind of dual pressures to both unlock the data and make it accessible, as well as actually keep it locked up and keep it safe. And you know, I really think that with the right governance tools and the right stream processing and streaming infrastructure, you can kind of start to do both at the same time. And I think these four principles of data meshes are actually a, a, a few key things to get right as you think about how you democratize data, um, how you start to decentralize it across an organization. And I think ultimately these, these decentralized approaches, they are a, a little bit of work to get right, but I think that they're necessary to scale. As an organization gets bigger, it invariably just gets slower and slower if you have monolithic systems, monolithic processes, technology built around monolithic principles. And you know, this, this problem of decentralizing and scaling the use of data is ultimately right at the heart of this overall project of helping companies become more software defined, helping them actually interconnect all the parts to really deliver first rate services to their customers. And I think this is an incredibly important project and right at the heart of what we're trying to help make possible in the larger Kafka community. So it's something I'm really excited about. And with that, I thank you very much and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Well, thanks, Jay. That was awesome and you know, as a, as a take home, I always try to think like, is there, a, is there a, a thing I should hang on to if I don't remember anything else? When we're thinking about data mesh, there's a lot to think about, but I think that analogy to microservices that Jay made early on, I think that's important. Like what that has done to application architecture, I think that's happening to analytics and I think data mesh is a part of that. So super cool stuff to be thinking about. I'm glad the community is reflecting on it. Next up, we've got a fireside chat. Now, there is no literal fire. I started to build one and they stopped me. They were saying something about health and safety and building codes and it was all very confusing. But we've got two people in this fireside chat, June Rao and Dusty Pierce. Now, June, you've seen him on this stage before. He's one of the co-creators of Apache Kafka. He's a co-founder of Confluent. Dusty is the VP of infrastructure at Instacart and he's got a pretty cool story to tell. June and Dusty, over to you. Thanks, team. So first of all, uh, welcome to Kafka Summit 2021, Dusty. Thank you. 
And thanks for taking time to share with us your experience at Instacart. I think a lot of our audience will find this uh, experience very interesting. Fantastic. To get us started, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and your role at uh, Instacart. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I guess we could, instead of fireside, we can call it surrounding one fern, instead <laughs> yes. of two ferns. Um, so I've been in software uh, leadership for about 30 years and seen a lot of changes over the time. And I've been lucky enough to be kind of working in some very fast moving companies kind of right at the edge. And between Life360 and Slack and now at Instacart, it's been a, a really wild ride. Um, at Instacart, I've been blessed to been offered an opportunity to hire and coach a group of leaders that span data engineering, security, cloud, platform, dev productivity, and uh, governance, risk, and compliance. And so it's a broad, diverse group of really talented engineers, and we're really excited about what we're doing there. Yeah, that's a great journey you have had so far. Um, so not everyone is necessarily familiar with Instacart as a business. Could you share with us a little bit uh, what Instacart is uh, as a business? Sure. Uh, Instacart, you know, related to Jay, Instacart was born, you know, as software, right? And yeah. some of these companies were born as software, and it's a digital marketplace. And I think that from that perspective, uh, our mission is to help people find the food that they love and get access to the food they love, and then spend more time enjoying it together. And as a company, uh, we are very distributed. We have software organizations that have a lot of agency and a lot of focus for the various areas of our marketplace. So whether it's the customers who are shopping or the shoppers who are delivering or the retailers who are putting their store online or the brands trying to reach the customers, each of those areas has a software team that's really focused on them. Yeah. That's good. And uh, earlier you were sharing with me an interesting anecdotal thing about Instacart that Instacart actually has more pick up locations than all the Starbucks and McDonald's in the U.S. combined. That's impressive. Yeah, so 50,000 locations between the U.S. and Canada. It's a really interesting trivia that I just found out recently. Sometimes I, I ask that question to people sometimes, and people have really wild notions of how many, I ask, how many Starbucks do you think there are in the United States, and someone said, a million. I'm like, well, no, not a million, but a lot. But yeah, it's, it's really remarkable how fast it's grown. You know, Instacart now is servicing, you know, pretty much a national infrastructure for food delivery. Yeah, that's good. So let's talk about uh, the technology. So what are the problems you and your team are trying to solve at uh, Instacart? Yeah, so, you know, it, it traces a little bit back. If you look back at Slack, I had the honor of, of working with some of the folks who really were the kind of founders of the DevOps movement uh, at Flickr. And really that evolved into this concept of service ownership. And at Instacart, as a distributed company with lots of different divisions working very fast and evolving in many different directions, what we really want to do is, what I have found is that startups are really good at making things, they're not as good at owning things. Yeah. And so the problem I feel like we're really trying to solve is that how do we make service ownership efficient, right? How do we reduce the cost of service ownership, which is the mission yeah. of my organization? And that problem spans lots of areas. And one of the specific ones and the reasons I'm here today is that on the data engineering side, how do we create ownership of data across the organization? And the data mesh concept is really like central to what we're trying to do there. Yeah, that's definitely interesting. I think data mesh and uh, event streaming, that's what we've seen a lot of the changes in other organizations as well. Um, let's talk about the impact of uh, pandemic COVID. Yeah. I think certainly, I think last year, um, we have been through this pandemic uh, uh, thing, and uh, a lot of the companies, especially retail, yeah. have been impacted a lot by this. So what's the impact of COVID to Instacart, and what are the challenges you guys have to face? Some of our challenges are, are not dissimilar to everyone else's. Mm -hmm. You know, suddenly having to work from home and the, the stress of doing your work and, and, and teaching your children school at home and still yeah. trying to push a business forward. I think those are always, you know, everyone has kind of gone through that over the last couple of years. But you know, Instacart certainly had a, a, a relatively unique place in that space. And what, what we kind of have done the math on is that we experienced about 10 years worth of growth in about eight weeks. Yeah. And so having been part of some of the fastest growing companies ever, you know, when I joined Instacart in January 2020, I had no idea what was coming. And, you know, that type of scale was really challenging for us, right? To, to not just for our software, but for our business processes, for pretty much all of our systems. And as our team was really talented and worked really hard to kind of get through that, we were able to support a lot of retail that had to transform overnight to become e-commerce companies. Mm -hmm. And they really needed to have a really positive experience with the customers. It's, it's really kind of a bummer to go online, order something, and then realize it's not gonna come, 
right? And so that kind of quality focused uh, mentality that we had internally and on the service we had for customers, I think was really the hallmark of how we got through the, the pandemic itself. But in many ways, the scale uh, was just really remarkable and unlike anything I've ever seen before. Yeah. That's definitely uh, a, a great story. I think the pandemic, in some sense, accelerated a lot of the digital transformation of a lot of the organizations like you guys. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about the uh, Kafka and Confluent. So yeah. could you share us uh, a little bit story about uh, the journey you guys have with Data in Motion, you know, Kafka and Confluent? Yeah. So you know, with Confluent specifically, at Slack we ran a very large Kafka instance on the metal with VMs, and, and we brought our own sidecars and transformed our event pipeline um, it, it, to Kafka. And, and we were really excited about that mentality. And when I got to Instacart, one of the things that happens with that really, really rapid growth is you don't have the staff, and you can't wait around to build the engineering team to build these very large systems and take care of them at scale. And so we knew very early on that we wanted a, an aggressive managed services strategy, whether that was with our cloud providers on databases or whether that is observability, but certainly for data in motion and our core nervous system or backbone, we knew that Kafka was definitely the tool that we wanted to use, and the question was how are we going to use it. We started trying with our cloud provider service, and it was able, to, able for us to get up and running really quickly. We were able to kind of provision things and get data, get our event stream starting to run. But we found that the, the support system just wasn't there. The expertise wasn't there. The experience wasn't there. Uh, you never want to call your, your, your service provider and they have to go find their Kafka expert. That's, that's a problem, right? And so for us, it was a very natural kind of you know, uh, evolution to say, hey, let's call Confluent and talk to them. These are the founders. These are the people who know it the best, who do it the best. And you know, it really was transformational for us. And, and I think that's a real secret to managed services in general is you, you want to be with folks who are completely com uh, committed and devoted and, and really experts in the system that they're supporting. And so uh, that's our journey to get to Confluent itself. And the process is kind of evolving. Uh, and, and I think you know, from I uh, mentioned early on, our distributed and our service ownership model mm -hmm. where we are trying to help software teams own their software better extends into the data space. Yeah. And I'm really excited about that and you know, working with our, our director of data engineering and executing this data mesh stra strategy, we're excited about where Confluence going there and then partnering with them on kind of frontiering that space. That's great, that's a great story to know. And uh, what are some of the use cases uh, of Kafka and Confluence you guys had in Instacart? Yeah, so you know, it's, some of them I feel like are almost table stakes, but maybe that's just the world I live in. But you know, certainly these ideas of a consolidated event stream so you can have a customer 360 solution. You know, that's to me a very central use case. Uh, because you know, in, in today's world, you can't just look at a graph and, and look at P50 and say, oh, here's my P50, here's my P90. You have to understand every customer's experience. And if a customer's having a bad day, you have to know who that customer is and how was their bad day. And you have to make that visible in your company. And you have to make that visible in real time because the software is evolving literally you know, with experiments and AB flags and whatnot all day long. And so I feel like that is now almost the de facto way that a lot of the modern software companies are running. And that is central to our use case. I think in addition to that, the timeliness of data, right? Like how you're moving data around the company. Oftentimes it's the, the, the pump and dump and query, right? Just dump it in a database and we'll run queries. But I think a lot of companies start out and they don't even realize that they have unbounded data problems until you start getting poured petabytes of data in a week and all of a sudden you realize, oh wow, I, I can't query this anymore. These are billions and billions and billions of rows. Yeah. And so we, we need a different solution. And so for us, Moving from kind of you know what I would call older ETL models to change data capture and streaming changes, not just to data warehouses or to cold storage, uh, but also to you know product teams that want to receive updates right away. And so the timeliness of data and of either its analytics or of order information across the company was a really important part of that backbone. Right. I think the last one that is less like table stakes and more specific to Instacart is. We have a really complicated problem. And if you think of 50,000 stores across you know, the United States and Canada, sure. the inventory of those stores really matters. And none of those, you know, these are grocery stores, or you know, these are not like really high-tech companies. 
they, you know, the, the idea of knowing what the inventory is in 50,000 stores at any given time is a really hard problem to solve because if you go to order milk and it's not there, you get upset. So we don't want you to order something that's not there. So we're constantly trying to get updates. Yeah. And a lot of that was using pretty older batch technology, uh, file exchanges. Yeah. And we have really kind of transformed that and now providing APIs for real-time updates. Because ultimately, it's better for the retailer, it's better for our customer, and it's actually cheaper for us than to just dump all the data in and then try and query it every time someone's looking for milk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah definitely. I think providing this like real-time experience to all the products like catalog, right. right, customer service, yeah, that's what a trend we have seen in a lot of other retailers and, uh, and the similar companies. Yeah. 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 So let's talk about uh, multi-cloud. I mm -hmm. think uh, a lot of companies, uh, of course, are moving towards cloud. And then when they move into cloud, often you know, they're thinking about this multi-cloud or hybrid strategy. Mm -hmm. What's your view on this? So you know, I, I think it's a, it's a hot topic. You know, there's a lot yep. of people with takes on it, both positive and negative. I think it's a really personal choice for every company, depending yep. on what their strategy is. My personal belief is that you know, multi-cloud makes sense, not so much in I want to take workload A and split it into two different places and kind of maybe compare them or have them compete. For me, it's more of like, where does this workload work best? What is the best of breed service that I can use, right? And that may be different cloud providers, that may be different managed service providers. And that's one way where you will see the kind of distribution of workloads across multiple clouds. Yeah. The, the other way is through mergers and acquisitions is pretty common, right? Like again, the, uh, oftentimes uh, cloud sales folks will get mad at me when I say, oh, cloud's a cloud. They're like, no, our cloud is better, it's different. But to some degree, that's true. And so I think that the choice you make as a company early on is, is important, but you develop your tooling around it. And when you acquire a company like that, oftentimes it doesn't make sense to migrate them just so that they can do the same thing on a different cloud. And so you, you have this multi-cloud strategy as you accumulate these parts. Yeah. And I think you know, central to all of that is the interoperability. Right? Right. Companies that want to grow, whether it's through merger or whether they want to expand internationally, now you need to talk about more than one data center. And at the root of that is like, what is your data interoper interoperability strategy? Right? Right. And we saw some examples earlier where how can I replicate data you know, yep. geographically? How can I replicate data between uh, data centers or between cloud providers? Yeah. And that is really the, the, the number one problem that you have in some of these integration efforts, right? Yeah. And so I think it's exciting to kind of lay, that, lay, lay those uh, tracks, if you will, and the groundwork using Confluent. Yeah, that, that's well said. I think that the kind of portability to be able to, whether to use the best breed of service, no matter where that service is, and dealing with merge and acquisition, right? That's, I think, uh, a trend that we, think we have seen in a lot of other places as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, because I, I, I do think that lift and shift is probably overplayed a little bit. I think we were talking about it before where, you know, in the old days, well, it's just Linux. Just run it over there, right? But there's a lot of tooling in today's version of that. It's just Kubernetes. Just run it over there. But I think the tooling that surrounds every cloud provider is somewhat unique. And what's interesting is that companies like Confluent will come meet you where, where you are, right? And so I think the, the idea of being proficient on all clouds is really important for managed service providers and maybe less pro important for someone like Instacart. Right, that's great. Okay, one last question for you, Dusty. Sure. Um, what's next for you and your, uh, your team at Instacart? Well, I think that you know we really want to innovate and push this service ownership model, right? And, and certainly our, our data mesh strategy and Confluent is central, it's a component of that. But we believe that teams need to be, need, need to understand security, need to understand reliability, quality, performance, and all of those things. And, and we're hoping to build the infrastructure and tooling to make that cheaper for them. For us, you know, the central nervous system of all of that is data and the data in motion that comes by kind of moving from a batch system to a real-time system. And the data mesh kind of experimentation and innovation that's coming and in, in, in our, in our partnership with you is something that we're really excited about. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, with this, uh, thank you for your time uh, for sharing your experience with us at Kafka Summit. And I wish you continued success of using Kafka and Confluent at Instacart oh, and you. enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank, thank you, you so much. It's a pleasure yeah. being here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. And uh, back to you, Tim. Thanks, June. All right, now just uh, a little bit of wrap up here. That word cloud I asked you about, uh, or I asked you to contribute to earlier, this is it. This is what you've got to say. Uh, man, there are a lot of beautiful words in there. Resilient, growing, collaborative, awesome, vibrant, open, exciting, connected, innovation, of course, streaming right in the middle. I guess that kind of makes sense. Uh, just a lot of great words. I'm looking at a bigger version over here. I'm not even gonna read them all. Check it out, it's really beautiful. Um, 
And we've gotten some great uh, comments in YouTube and in Slack, other places. Uh, uh, Nilima, Serhi, Farsin, I, I see you. Thanks for your kind words. Uh, wrapping up, uh, huge thanks to the program committee. This is our third summit this year. And uh, there's over 100 sessions. These folks have reviewed them all. Uh, and this is, again, one of the most energetic program committees I've ever seen. So thank you. If you see them online, see them on Twitter, anything, give them uh, words of gratitude for their work here. Um, also, don't forget, the, the live portion is coming to an end now. You're going to see pre-recorded talks. But the speakers are there live. I'll be there later today uh, during my session. You know, uh, use that. You ask questions. Interact. It's, it's really kind of a cool thing of, of the online format. So do that for sure. Also, rate the sessions you attend. As a speaker myself, I love it when conferences give me rating information, right? Sometimes it's not the happy story you want. Sometimes it is. But like, we need to know. So please, please do those ratings. Uh, we really appreciate it. Also, Kafka Summit uh, online is free to attend. It's you might not be surprised to learn, not free to produce. So uh, these sponsors are literally critical to this effort. They make it possible. Uh, please go visit them in their virtual booth if you've got useful things to talk to them about. That's why they're here. Uh, don't forget to tweet. Use the Kafka Summit hashtag, inspirational quote from your favorite talk, whatever it is. I would love to see that hashtag just light up in these next two days. I'd also love to see your faces. If you're a selfie person, uh, let's see your beautiful face and maybe your computer uh, with Kafka Summit uh, open in the browser there with the streaming selfie hashtag. Uh, always fun to see those. Under the resources tab, be sure to check out the code of conduct. Very important. Um, it's not an in-person event, but we're still interacting with each other. And there are expectations that we have for how that'll go down. And this, this is enforced. So check it out. Make this a safe and inclusive and, and welcoming place for everybody. Also, feedback on Summit generally, not on individual talks, but just what did you think of the hybrid thing? What did you think of the online platform? We want to know. Give us your feedback. And uh, we absolutely do review all of that after the fact. So with that, it's time to get to sessions. I won't hold you up any longer. Look forward to seeing you online. Thanks.